Yeah, thanks, uh, 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 Ellen. Uh, yeah, before I start, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for invite, inviting me to participate and uh, uh, give a talk. Yeah, it has been a very wonderful stay uh, so far uh, at ICTS. And thank you so much for the, the organizers. Okay, so uh, as the title said, I will talk about hypergeometric groups uh, and discuss the problem asked about their arithmeticity and something, something called thinness. I'll be defining all the terms uh, being used. And uh, yeah, what I decided to speak today, that will be mostly uh, based on uh, joint work with uh, Venkat Ramana, who gave a wonderful talk uh, uh, just a few minutes back. Uh, yeah, basically just to, uh, uh, like for the quick motivation, I will go uh, there in details. But one thing we know that uh, if G is a semi-simple algebraic group defined over Q, then uh, it's uh, uh, integer points, uh, uh, ZZ is a lattice uh, in ZR. So this is the result uh, due to Borel Harishandra. And therefore, uh, if you have any gamma subgroup of GZ, which is a finite index, then gamma is also going to be a lattice. Gamma of finite index index is also a lattice. Uh, in uh, Z of R. And on the, on the other hand, uh, there is a result uh, called Borel density theorem that if you have a lattice uh, gamma, uh, if you have a lattice gamma in GR, uh, then gamma is Jariski dense uh, uh, inside uh, GR. So in particular, if gamma uh, is a finite index subgroup of uh, ZZ, in this index, like finite index. That means this is lattice. This implies that uh, Jariski closure of gamma is so Jariski closure of gamma is pool of Z. This is called yeah. This is due to Borel density theorem. So now one can ask if the converse of that statement uh, holds. Like suppose you have a subgroup gamma of G Z, which is Jariski dense. So does it imply that the gamma is a lattice uh, in G? It's like, <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like, that's what I'm saying. That if gamma is of a finite index, that implies that just the closure of gamma is full of Z. Suppose you have a subgroup gamma of GZ, which is Jariski dense in Z. So does it imply that if gamma is a finite index, I know it's like, this is not the question to ask, but somehow means I'm going to uh, give uh, like a lot of examples through uh, hypergeometric differential equations uh, where uh, we get that this converse is not uh, true in general. Uh, yeah, if you want to see a quick example, I think we uh, saw in the last lecture that uh, if you consider the following subgroup generated by these two inputting matrices, uh, solve that like this, uh, yeah, generated by these is of course, because it contains all the inputting elements, this subgroup generated by these two matrices for any integer, in fact, is the risky dense inside SL to Z, but it is of infinite index if M is greater or equal to three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is not, uh, uh, I think, right place to start my talk uh, <laughs> by stating <laughs> this kind of questions. But generally, I do when the audience is quite uh, mixed. Like, but <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is Jariski uh, dense, but of uh, infinite index. 
or in SL to Z. Okay, so now I'm like, yeah, so this is just uh, to start with. Now I'm going to define properly uh, uh, a group that is called a hypergeometric group. They are actually Mondrami, uh, a group of some hypergeometric differential equations, and then uh, discuss the question uh, about their arithmeticity and thinness. So for that, uh, let's first define what is called a hypergeometric differential equation. So far, uh, let us fix this notation for the differential operator d by dz on the Riemann surface uh, E1c minus these three points. And uh, take two complex n tuples alpha and beta. This is alpha 1. and CM, uh, then define a differential operator uh, B alpha beta as theta plus beta one minus one, theta plus beta two minus one, theta plus beta n minus one, minus J, theta plus alpha one, theta plus alpha two, Theta plus alpha n. And if you expand this operator, then this is an operator of the following form, like because you know that this is j to the power n, 1 minus j, or dn dz n plus some polynomial, uh, p1z times j to the power n minus 1, dn minus 1, dz n minus 1, plus plus, yeah, pnz where uh, these PJJs are polynomial with complex groups. Uh, define this operator D alpha beta and consider the differential equation of D alpha beta U is equal to zero on P1 minus uh, these three points. So uh, from uh, like from here, from here, like uh, uh, the, from the definition of d alpha beta, it is immediate. It is immediate that uh, z is equal to zero and one are something called uh, uh, regular singularity. Uh, let's write this equation as a star of the differential equation is star. And uh, by transforming uh, z to 1 by z, means this is small z and I'm writing this capital Z, one can check that z is equal to infinity is also a regular singularity. D alpha beta of u is equal to zero, means this is work like uh, operating on a set of analytic functions on uh, this uh, uh, analytic functions. Uh, yeah, this is a differential equation on. Uh, so this is how such equations, uh, like this equation of the type star is called a hypergeometric equation. star is called a hypergeometric equation. Now I'm going to define uh, the action of the fundamental group of P1 minus three point on some local solution space of this equation. Uh, 
No, no, but like, no, no, for some, this is in general, this is how hypergeometric differential equations are defined. So, uh, yeah, it had some application in physics. I'm not actually aware of that, but there is something called, uh, uh, there is some 14 families of Calabuyau three folds, which fiber over uh, P1 minus three point. So we get the uh, uh, Xn of the fundamental group, uh, P1 minus three point, which is actually a free group and two generators on uh, some middle cohomology of uh, uncertain subspace of the middle cohomology of the fiber. And actually in those 14 cases, uh, it is shown by some physicists that uh, actually those groups are actually hypergeometric that I'm going to define. So that is main motivation for looking for uh, such differential equations. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like there is like family of Calabi or three fold switch fiber over this P or minus three point. Yeah, that part. <laughs> Yeah, K3 surfaces. Yeah, I'll, I'll come to Okay. So uh, now let, let's fix this narration. Why you means, yeah, now first uh, 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 let, let us take a point, Z not say uh, one by two in P1C minus zero one infinity. So basically, uh, this is zero, it's like this is Z naught. And the uh, fix pi one, the notation for the fundamental group of, uh, uh, of P1C minus uh, these three points. So yeah, which is basically uh, like this fundamental group, it's same as the fundamental group of figure eight, which is a free group on two generators. So, so, yeah, let G not uh, be a loop around zero. And so this point is one. And uh, Z1 uh, be a loop around one. So we know that uh, the fun this fundamental group is actually the free group on the path homotopy classes of these two uh, loops. Uh, but I want to consider this as a group generated by three elements, like G0 is the path homotopy classes, uh, path homotopy class of the loop around zero. This is the same around one. And I want to include G infinity also. So that is, uh, This is the pathomotopic class of the loop around infinity. So if I consider three generators for this fundamental group, then we have one additional relation like G infinity, G1, Z naught is one. So to define the action of pi one on the solution space of that differential equation is star. Yeah, let me just explain. I'm now going to construct a representat representation uh, row from pi one to uh, uh, ZL and C. So this will work uh, uh, like this. So first what I do, I consider a small open disk centered at Z naught, uh, since this, uh, uh, suppose this disk is U, 
So the differential equation like the alpha beta u is zero on u is of course regular, means it does not have any singular point. And uh, so, you know, like there, there may be some smaller open disk inside u where the solution is space of that uh, regular in order linear differential equation is n dimensional and the basis uh, and basis of the solution is space can be given by n linearly independent analytic functions. So let that open set is U, where this equation is regular, and let's fix a basis. And let F1, F2, Fn uh, are n linearly independent analytic functions on U, which form a basis for the solution space of e star on u. I can take the unit just by going by a smaller uh, open disk. I can always so assume that this is suppose u is there where I fix a basis containing n linearly independent vectors that form uh, a basis for uh, the solution space uh, on u. And now, means, yeah, to define the action of pi one on, yeah, uh, let's denote the solution space uh, by the notation V. V is, of course, a n-dimensional complex vector space. Yeah, V of a star on U. So uh, we know that this pi one is generated by these three loops. So to define the action of pi one on V, it's enough to define the action of generators and then uh, extend uh, using the group operations. Right. So what we do means I'm going to define the action of G naught on the solution space uh, V and the similarly the action of G1 and G infinity can be defined. So I take uh, a point on the intersection of this uh, loop and of this open disk and again, by the same method, means I consider a open I consider a open disk centered at that point, and then by means I know there exists another this open set centered at this point that we denote by u one. And if I consider the differential equation is star and u one again that is irregular, and I get a basis containing n linearly independent analytic functions on u one, right? So, but we see that uh, uh, on U, if I restrict uh, this, uh, let's like, uh, I'm going to basically analytically continue first uh, means this basis elements along the loop uh, Z naught and see that how it gets changed when I return back to the original uh, disk. So if I consider the restriction, let's, let's write this F1 only. If I restrict F1 on U1 intersection U2, then I know that uh, this restriction actually satisfies the differential equation B alpha beta u is equal to zero on u intersection u1. And uh, yeah, so uh, let's write like let h1, h2, hn be a basis. of the solution space of a star on u1. Then you know that if I restrict this h1, h2, hn on this intersection, again, I get a linearly independent analytic function, and linearly independent analytic function. So that will form the restrictions of h1, h2, hn on u intersection u1 will form a basis for the solution space of this equation on the intersection. So and f1 restricted over u1 interse u intersection u1. Uh, is already a solution of this. So therefore, I will be able to write restriction of F1 on U intersection U1 as linear combinations of restrictions of these analytic functions. So let's write this as, a, let's say, a Fj1, Hj restricted over U intersection U1, where J varies from 1 to N. And the intersection of u and u1, I have uh, this relation. Then you know that if I define the function uh, f1 hat 
of j as summation j is equal to 1 to n if j i h j on whole of u1, then this f1 hat is clearly an analytic continuation of uh, f1 on u1. Hmm? Okay, uh, uh, f j1, sorry. Thank you. All right, so this is how I'll keep uh, uh, going. And also it actually follows from the, basically like, yeah, this is how I continually continue F1, F2, uh, Fn on this and keep on going. And when I return back, I get another set of N linearly independent solution on the same uh, U. Yeah, F1, same thing can be done for uh, 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 F2, F3 and other. So when I did binality continuous and I go along G naught and come back to the same uh, open disk U, I get, uh, I get that uh, this uh, original basis is being mapped to another basis. Let's do you know, yeah, just I do not have uh, uh, many of the notations. So excuse me, I'm using like this uh, new basis as H1, H2, HN on, you, from where I had started, open this center at J1. So then what happens? It means I'm mapping F1 is being mapped to H1 and, H, uh, and H1 is nothing but, yeah, something like this relation is there. H, yeah, H1 where H1 Z is defined as a summation. I mean, because I know that this is already a basis for a solution space on new. This new basis elements can be written as linear combinations of the old one. Change of basis matrix sort of will get. So this is summation Hj. Okay, let's write general uh, Fk being mapped to Hk, and this is nothing but Hjk or Fj. J is equal to one to n. So this is how I'm able to associate and able to send the generator G not to the corresponding n cross n matrix that I'm writing here as uh, Hjk. Of course, J, K takes value between one and N, and this is a matrix in G, L, and C. And similarly, G1 and G infinity also can be mapped to uh, N cross N matrices in uh, G, L, and C. So this is how I get uh, a represent representation of uh, uh, pi one inside uh, G, L, and C. Oh, good that I still have 50 minutes. No? <laughs> Shall I start the stopwatch? Or... No, no, I... I'm just okay. So, this is how we define the means. This is how I get a representation a row from phi 1 to uh, uh, GL and C, or let me just write uh, GLV. Of course, this is same as GL and C uh, if you uh, fix a basis. So this representation, uh, row, uh, the, the row with that uh, we got, uh, we just now got, is called a monodromy representation. And image of pi one under row, uh, a subgroup of uh, GLV is called a mon monodromy group. group of the hypergeometric equation uh, star. So now uh, there is a theorem by Levelt, which actually classifies uh, all the monodromic groups of the hypergeometric equation in case uh, where uh, alpha j and uh, like, yeah, uh, al yeah sort of alpha and beta are distinct modulo uh, integers. So I'll, I'll just stay. So if alpha j is not equal to beta k, uh, alpha j is not equal to beta k mod j for all j k between one to n, 
Remember, alpha beta uh, I had used to define this operator D alpha beta. Then there exists a basis of V with respect to which Uh, with respect to which uh, row pi 1 is generated by these two matrices, I'm going to write next what uh, are A and B, where A and B are the companion matrices of the polynomials uh, fx fx is the following product of x minus e to the power 2 pi i alpha j j is equal to 1 to n and gx is product of uh, x minus e to the power 2 pi i beta j j is equal to 1 uh, just to recall uh, that uh, yeah, it will be helpful if we write this uh, polynomial a to the power n plus a n minus 1 x to the power n minus 1 plus plus a 1 x plus a naught and uh, zx as x to the power n plus bn minus 1 x to the power n minus 1 plus b1x plus b0. So companion matrix is nothing but the n cross n matrix uh, which has lower diagonal entries 1 and the last column of that matrix is actually negative of the coefficients of this polynomial. And uh, companion matrix has a property that if you write down uh, its characteristic polynomial, then you get the exactly uh, same polynomial whose companion matrix is the given matrix. Yeah, fx and uh, gx, let's say, respectively. And not only this, there is a rigidity condition that uh, moreover, if Sigma is any other representation of pi one inside the uh, GLNC or GLV such that, uh, yeah, here also I should have said that, uh, uh, yeah. So this uh, Mondrami group is generated by these two matrices. They are companion matrices of the polynomials F and G. And the Mondrami representation is defined by sending G infinity to uh, Z infinity to A, Z1 to A inverse B, and Z naught to B inverse. So row of G infinity is being mapped on A, Z1 is being mapped on A inverse B, and Z naught is being mapped on B uh, inverse. And uh, it is simply the property of a companion matrix that, you know, means like, a inverse B is a kind of uh, matrix uh, that sends, B will send E1 to E2 and A inverse will pull back E2 to E1. And that will, uh, so that means the A inverse B will act trivially on the basis vectors E1, E2, En minus one. So in other words, like the rank of uh, Z1, rank of this row of G1 minus identity is one. Actually, yeah, this uh, row of G1, X uh, trivially on a subspace of co-dimension one. Okay. Up to En minus, we will send En minus one to En and A inverse of En is En minus one. So it will fix the vectors E1, E2, En minus one and En will be uh, sent to, uh, So uh, yeah, so that is also part of uh, the rigidity condition that if a, a sigma is any other representation uh, of pi one, such that, such that uh, the characteristic polynomial of sigma z infinity 
is if sigma z not inverse is z and sigma z1 uh, is a transvection. Uh, transvection also called complex reflection. Basically, it means that uh, 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 sigma z1 minus identity has a rank one. Is a transvection. Then uh, this sigma uh, is equivalent to rho. A sigma G1 is transfection and also this would be like the characteristic polynomial of sigma Z infinity should be F and uh, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, and also uh, the restriction on A and B like uh, this uh, one should observe that alpha J uh, is not equal to beta K mod Z that means that these two polynomials F and G are co-prime. They don't have any common uh, uh, roots. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, so uh, now what I'm going to do uh, that, uh, so, you know, means for a given row, let's fix and uh, one can always define a, a sigma from pi one to ZLV star. Since we have uh, this row, uh, the representation of pi one inside GLV, we like this is dual representation, like V star is V dual uh, as sigma of uh, some element W in pi one will be mapped to uh, row of, uh, yeah, W inverse uh, transpose. This is how it acts on dual, right? So I just means, you know, that uh, this sigma is another monodromic representation uh, of pi one uh, inside GLN C. And we get that the sigma will be equivalent to rho if the monodromy, achha, this is W in pi one. Uh, if the monodromy matrices will have the characteristic polynomials F and G. And also uh, that condition is easy, like anyway, like because uh, row of G1 minus I has uh, rank one, sigma G1 minus I will have a uh, rank one. This is just the transpose inverse. So for that, uh, if I assume, uh, assume that uh, F and G are something called uh, self reciprocal. So it basically means that uh, if uh, A is a root, then one by A is also a root of F and G. And if that is the case, then you know that uh, uh, the characteristic polynomial of sigma Z infinity will be that of uh, uh, rho Z infinity and that is uh, uh, F. Okay? And similarly characteristic polynomial of sigma Z naught inverse will be that of Z. And anyway, like sigma of uh, Z1 is a uh, transfection. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, because of the rigidity condition of rigidity condition of this level theorem, we get that uh, in case F and G are self-reciprocal, we get that the sigma is equivalent to uh, a rho. So what does uh, that mean? Uh, that means uh, that there exists an isomorphism. I means actually there exists a pi one isomorphism in home V V star. Basically, like equivalent means uh, this is what like sigma uh, uh, sigma uh, like. Uh, 
pi one x on v star through sigma and the x on v through rho. So there exists a yeah g like pi one isomorphism in this, and uh, you know means like this is uh, nothing but uh, a homomorphism from v to v star correspond to a bilinear form uh, on v means from v cross v to uh, c you can say. And isomorphism will correspond to a non-degenerate bilinear form. This uh, we have we already know from simple linear algebra. So there exists isomorphism uh, in this. Let uh, yeah. Let's denote uh, yeah the isomorphism in this. Uh, yeah, this is identified as uh, a space of all uh, bilinear forms uh, on uh, V. So this equivalently a bilinear form or non-degenerate bilinear form uh, let's denote by script B or non-degenerate uh, pi one invariant no? because this is a pi one I saw a pi one invariant bilinear form B on B. So, so far I have used the fact that uh, F and G are co-prime and they are sort of uh, uh, self-reciprocal, uh, basically means that, yeah, if A is a root, 1 by A is also a root of F and using that I got uh, that there is a bilinear form, non degenerate bilinear form on V that is being preserved uh, uh, by pi 1. And uh, this is a simple application of... Uh, uh, yeah, and also another thing is it's not uh, difficult to show that uh, the condition on F and G being co-prime ensures that the action of pi one on V, therefore on V star is also irreducible. Right. So then uh, we can use Schur's lemma, and that says that uh, the space of all pi one invariant uh, bilinear form on V is one dimensional. So, and also since V preserves B, V will preserve V transpose also. So therefore, since this is one dimensional, B transpose will have to be some scalar multiple of B. B like, because if, uh, the group pi one preserves B, then it will preserve B transpose also. Right? Preserving means that, yeah, I'm a very sort of notation, but W transpose B, W is B. This is what I mean. So if it preserves B, then uh, it will preserve B transpose also. And if I take transpose again, then that implies that lambda square is one. So this implies lambda has to be plus minus one. So if the pair of polynomials are co-prime and self-reciprocal, then I get a bilinear form preserved by pi one that is either symplectic, means like the first one is either symmetric or symplectic. Symplectic is corresponding to lambda is equal to minus one and symmetric is corresponding to one. And also, uh, it is not uh, difficult to show that determinant of A inverse B, means A inverse B will be sort of, here we'll get one, 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 and the last entry will be uh, some C, and this last column will be on the other entries are zero. So this is how A inverse B will look like. So determinant of A inverse B is nothing but this C, if this C is, yeah, I, I have already said plus one implies that uh, B is symmetric and uh, this is minus one implies B is symplectic. Yeah. So this is how I get that, uh, 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 yeah. Oh. Yeah. This uh, group generated by these two matrices, let's denote this uh, as gamma.
the uh, monodromic group of the hypergeometric equation associated to the pair of polynomials uh, f and g. And they are also called, uh, because they are monodromic group of these hypergeometric uh, equations, they are called uh, hypergeometric groups. Uh, groups of this form are called hypergeometric groups. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, now I can state uh, the theorem of uh, Boykers and uh, uh, Hickman, uh, which says that uh, with the ongoing assumptions on F and G, like their co prime and uh, uh, self reciprocal, if we also assume that FG form a primitive pair, primitive pair means that uh, if FG also form. A, a primitive pair. Primitive pair means like they cannot be uh, written as a polynomial in x to the power k for some k bigger than uh, 2, greater or equal to 2. Like uh, there does not exist f1, f2 in Cx such that uh, fx is f1 x to the power k and gx is f2 x to the power k for uh, some k greater equal to 2. If fg also form a primitive pair, then, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, that does not exist. Yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah that does not, they uh, just means that, it's, that such pairs are called imprimitive. Yeah, uh, then F zero is equal to Z zero is equal to one implies that uh, this gamma F Z is contained inside the, I'm writing the, uh, as a uh, just No, I'm saying that uh, with that assumption, if F zero is Z zero is one, then the hypergeometric group gamma F Z preserves a non-degenerate symplectic form omega and gamma fg sits inside the corresponding symplectic group as a Jariski dense uh, subgroup. And f0 by z0 is minus 1 implies that gamma fg sits inside, like gamma fg will preserve a non-degenerate quadratic form q and gamma fg sits inside the orthogonal group of that quadratic form. But it is Jariski dense only when gamma fg is infinite. And uh, uh, is here, this is the risk dense and is the risk dense if gamma fg is not uh, finite. And they have also nicely classified uh, all such pairs of polynomials for which the corresponding hypergeometric group is finite. They correspond to uh, some parameter they call that uh, uh, if, if and only like uh, if the corresponding parameters uh, uh, alpha j uh, like and beta j uh, they interlace on unit circle. So that is also uh, there. I'm not going to write that. So this is what uh, uh, we get. Yeah, and also in the same paper. Uh, uh, they have uh, mentioned that uh, uh, it is not uh, clear exactly like for what uh, f and g gamma fz is even a discrete group. Uh, but one thing is immediate that uh, if I take fz in zx, uh, like I want a and b matrices in gl and z, so I should have some control on the, the constraint term of this polynomial. So with F0, Z0, both are unit in uh, Z plus. Then this condition implies that the generating matrices belong to ZL and Z. So therefore, uh, gamma FZ being generated by these two matrices uh, is a subgroup of ZL and Z and hence is discrete. 
So now onward, I will assume that gamma Fz is a subgroup of GLNZ. F and G are integer coefficient polynomial, uh, satisfying all those conditions uh, with, uh, yeah, the constant term is plus minus one. So now here is a definition uh, that, uh, yeah, well, uh, let me define, let G be, yeah, first let gamma be a subgroup of GL and Z and G be the Jariski closure. closure of uh, gamma inside uh, ZL and C, then uh, uh, then uh, gamma is called thin as far as you know, this name was given by Peter Sarnak, no? this, the thin such, such groups were there like uh, from old time, but he we started calling them thin. If uh, index of gamma in GZ, uh, means like if index of gamma in GZ is infinite and uh, arithmetic otherwise. It's not uh, like this, yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, gamma is called thin if index of gamma inside the integer point of the Jariski closure is infinite, otherwise it is called arithmetic. So uh, then this question, actually we came to know from Sarnath only that uh, classify all the, uh, is it possible to classify all the hypergeometric differential equations whose uh, associated monodromic groups are arithmetic are thin. And also like using Lewell's theorem, you know, on a very nice uh, sort of uh, uh, correspondence between the differential equation and like actually classifying the differential equation, it's sort of equivalent to classify the pair of polynomials Fz corresponding to which the associated uh, hypergeometric group is arithmetic or uh, thin. So what we did, so this was the question, and then uh, here is an answer. Uh, and that answer is a theorem uh, by me and Venkat Ramana. So, uh, and also means, uh, I'm, I'm just looking for the pair of polynomials having integer coefficients with constant term plus minus one and another conditions you should not forget that they should be co-prime and they should form a primitive pair and uh, it, they should be a self-reciprocal. So actually a lot of examples are there. For example, if I consider F and G both as product of cyclotomic polynomials. So that self-reciprocal condition will be taken care of and the, this integrality also. Uh, like, for example, I can take f as uh, x minus 1 to the power 4 and take z as x square minus x plus 1. Right? So this here I know that it corresponds to 0, 0, 0 alpha and here beta is the sixth root of unity, like 1 by 6, uh, 1 by 6, 5 by 6, 5 by 6. This is the corresponding uh, alpha and beta. So a lot of examples one can construct uh, or such fg. So with the conditions of Boykan and Heckman, it tells that if uh, yeah, if the leading coefficient, uh, let's say c of f minus g satisfies uh, the condition that mod c is less or equal to 2, then uh, the corresponding gamma fg is arithmetic is arithmetic uh, inside the corresponding symplectic group and also one thing is clear like the conditions that uh, 
the polynomials f and g are uh, co prime and self reciprocal and both of them having constant term one no? means i am looking for this yeah an answer is to write in symplectic case and symplectic case means that f0 and g0 both should be one uh, yeah in symplectic case like uh, for a given f and g, if we just look at the leading coefficient of f minus g, if that leading coefficient is plus minus 1 or plus minus 2, then we get that the corresponding hypergeometric group is actually arithmetic. And uh, yeah, as I was telling, uh, that uh, the condition that f and g are self reciprocal co prime and both of them have constant term 1 ensures that the degree of the polynomial should be an even number. Those three conditions will not uh, hold if n is odd. So I did not write, but uh, uh, here I can write that this is sort of redundant. Like if n is get n is an even number. So I should say that n get equal to four because n is equal to two is a sort of a classical uh, uh, result. Uh, and uh, uh, in the proof of this theorem, actually I had planned. This is how. Uh, I had planned that I will state this theorem and see some applications, and then maybe I'll be able to sketch the proof, but I'm um, running short of time. But this C has the following role, means very nicely we have used the fact that uh, uh, the subgroup, the C satisfying this condition, mod C lesser equal to two, one C zero one, and uh, one C, by one zero C one, Th this two matrices actually generate a finite index subgroup of SL2Z if C is plus minus one or plus minus two. So this is the main uh, thing we have used in the proof. So this is why we are not able to extend this result for other C as we just saw that for C3, this generate an infinite index subgroup of SL2Z. Okay, I think, uh, so I shall stop, but I'm still uh, around if you're interested in proof and also I'm prepared well. So <laughs> I can explain like, yeah, if anyone is interested, we can discuss the proof of this there and see uh, some applications. Maybe just a quick remark, uh, uh, no, just half a minute maybe. So I, no, no, because like I just said no, that to construct such examples, one can uh, think of F and G as product of psychotomic polynomials. So that F and G are of degree four, F and G are products of psychotomic polynomials and degree of F and G are four. So you see that there are total 111 pairs of uh, polynomials that satisfy the conditions of Boykers and Ekman. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, it was expected that most of those 111 groups are thin uh, we got that uh, 60 of 111 actually satisfies this criterion of uh, uh, this theorem, single and Venkat Ramana. Uh, so the arithmeticity of more than half of those groups actually follows from uh, directly from uh, this theorem. Uh, yeah, that is also sort of done out of 111. Everything is done when some of them, uh, some of them is done by me and uh, some other people uh, and uh, yeah for thinness as like we have been uh, seeing uh, in the lectures that uh, in higher rank case sp4 of course the rank is two so if you can prove that this gamma fg the group nicely generated by two elements uh, is actually a free group or it contains a free subgroup of finite index then the thinness follows no, no i'm saying that uh, directly out of 111 60 of 111 satisfy uh, that uh, uh, condition. That mod C, C is the leading coefficient of the difference polynomials. Mod C is equal to two, so arithmeticity follows. And some of other cases where uh, some people like Brav and Thomas uh, uh, were able to, play, <laughs> able to play ping pong. And using that, uh, they, uh, they actually showed that uh, uh, some groups are either free or they contain free subgroups of finite index. So therefore, uh, those are uh, thin groups. Uh, more than 60 means many more. In fact, I think uh, just uh, uh, here n is four. Sorry, I, uh, yeah, yeah. 
Since I, n is four means like n in case n is equal to four and fg product of cyclotomic polynomials and both have constant term one and they satisfy this Bjorkas Boyker segment condition f and g are co prime. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, all lie in GL4, yes. So there are 111 uh, such possible pairs of, like for example, I can write many, like if I take x minus one to the power four, this is like phi one to the power four, right? So take phi two to the power four. This is also uh, another, like this one pair. Corresponding to this, I get, uh, if I take phi three, then x square plus x plus one uh, square. This is another pair and th this way, one can take x square plus one whole square, I means this is like corresponding to phi four, and this is. Oh, I thought question is started. No, I'm done, I'm done. Yeah, thank you so much for. Which one? N can be any number here, n greater equal to four, I wrote now. Yeah, this is for any uh, uh, n. This criteria holds for any n. Uh, for you, n is equal to 1000 also will work. <laughs> oh, that will be nice question to think of. Uh, I think in case n is equal to four, uh, everything is known. Yeah, uh, sort of. And also like uh, uh, unknown thing, like Mindy, I, I did not discuss the other part where uh, F zero by G zero is minus one and gamma F is infinite, then this is the risky then subgroup inside the orthogonal group. And in that case, actually when the uh, rank of the corresponding orthogonal group is one, uh, like Fuchs, Mary, and Sarnak had provided uh, seven infinite family of thin hypergeometric groups. And some of them are uh, like, and some other like corresponding to uh, higher real rank and Q rank at least one, like just by using the result Venkat Ramana was talking about in the last lecture. I and uh, yeah, I with Buzzpe and independently also, and uh, like there's some result in direction of arithmetic uh, hypergeometric groups uh, in orthogonal case also. So there are some cases are still uh, uh, left in case n is equal to five. So n is equal to four, if there are some real world in standard, n is previously number in two. Yeah. But the one in the and this is like, uh, this is uh, some special case. Now here, uh, 111 have the restriction on f and g, that f and g have only roots of unity as their roots. But this theorem uh, does not have such restriction. So here one can construct, construct many more. I'm saying that this this does not uh, this theorem does not require that the roots of f and g are roots of unity. This is general take any f and g integer coefficient polynomial having constant term one, satisfying the conditions of Boykers and Hickman. Huh? For n uh, equal to four also, but for the, no no for any n. This is for any n. For any n, you just take f and g integer coefficient polynomials having constant term one. And F and G should satisfy uh, Boyker segment condition. They should form a self, uh, they should be self reciprocal and uh, F and G should be co prime. Uh, then uh, uh, we get that if uh, the leading coefficient of the difference polynomial satisfy this condition, what C less or equal to two, then the corresponding hypergeometric group is arithmetic. Yeah, very general thing. These are just applications in geometry because the monodromy we get from uh, algebraic geometry, like they are sort of quasi unipotent. So there, the monodromy matrices have roots of unity as their roots. So, so this. Is... So perhaps we can defer any more questions and discussion with Sandeep till lunchtime. Once again, thanks very much, Sandeep. Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thanks a lot.